Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Introduce that then. <clears throat> Welcome back to episode 39 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. I'm looking forward to this episode, but I'm not quite sure what to expect, Bob. So this episode, what we're going to be talking about is erotic transference within the therapy process. Another one of your wonderful titles, Bob. Tell me more. Yeah, so what isn't spoken about that much in podcasts or seminars or, or videos is um, sex in the therapy room or the um, expression of sexual feelings uh, either by the therapist or the client or the absence of the expression of sexual feelings from either the therapist or the client. So you've been working quite a way, quite a while as a therapist. Yeah. So how many times have you actually said, if at all, uh, that you have sexual feelings for a client? Now you may of course decide clinically not to, or you may have never had any sexual feelings towards any of the clients you've ever worked with. I don't know, but those are my questions to you. One, I don't know whether I would, and two, I never have. <laughs> Gosh, that's extraordinary. In yeah. my opinion. what about the other way around then? If clients have to, said to you, uh, they've got uh, you know feelings at a romantic level towards you. I haven't experienced that, but I have experienced. Uh, highly sexualized male client in the therapy room that was openly talking about lots of sexual things but he didn't direct it at me if that makes sense so there was generalized sexualized talk but he didn't say that anything about me in particular okay so let's well i'm surprised at the first particularly um I think majority of therapists have had or do have sexual feelings towards their clients. Um, unfortunately, what they do most of them particularly is shut down part of themselves because they either feel ashamed or they feel the ramifications of what, to do, what will happen if they mention that they feel attracted to their clients. Um, and in this day and age of litigation yeah. and ethical processes, they, I think, shut down part of themselves, which is a great shame as far as I'm concerned. What I think should happen is, <clears throat> is to take it to supervision. Yeah. I think I probably would if ever I had. I'm, I'm thinking while you're talking, I'm questioning <laughs> myself, have I ever had? And the, the only explanation I could potentially have is that all my long-term clients are female and I'm not attracted to females. So any male clients that I have, they tend to come for short periods of time. So mm. whether that's because I haven't built up a relationship with them over a long period of time that could have, have an impact on it. I don't know, but no, I, I haven't. But then okay. I don't think I'm a very sexualized person generally. <laughs> Let's move away from that to talk about this theoretically and practically really, because as a supervisor, I have had quite a few times when people have uh, come to me with this dilemma. And of course, as a, being a therapist for, for a very long time, I have had this, um, what we're talking about here myself, uh, quite uh, quite a lot. So I think if, if this ever happens, I think the first question that a therapist needs to ask themselves is who, you know, <clears throat> where do the sexual feelings originate from? Them? In other words, are they projected onto me from the client or are they actual feelings that I have uh, for myself physically, yeah. Uh, if if it answers 
if we answer the first one, the sort of projection uh, in terms of projective identification, you know, projection onto the, the onto the therapist, uh, then the important question is, what does the therapist do with that then, if they come to that conclusion? Um, I think they do need to take the supervision. If they come to a conclusion that they actually feel uh, attracted to the, the, um, the client, then they need to think about what they do about that. Yeah. First step, I think, is to take it to supervision and explore um, both those options I've just talked about, whether it comes from a transferential place where the client, uh, for many different reasons, could be projecting into the therapist um, sexual feelings um, and also to inquire themselves and uh, talk about their uh, um, sections towards the client and if they can work through that with the client and if they can't and they can't see beyond that they need to refer the client on yes mm. so um quite often <clears throat> i do think i do think therapists and i i don't particularly place this onto you jackie because i heard what you said but I, I think quite a lot of therapists often shut down part of themselves. Maybe, the maybe that's what I've done, yeah. Or the, because they're afraid of, A, the consequences of that, B, they might feel ashamed for some reasons, and, and C, um, they may not want that clinically in many different reasons. However, you know, in the world of relational psychotherapy and intersubjectivity, it's, I think, a dimension missing if you cut down part of yourself. You see, I think that actually you should be bringing the whole of yourself to a relational process and not shut down or compartmentalise part of yourself. That is a very good point, Bob. Maybe that part of some of us is already shut down, whether we're in the therapy room or out of the therapy room. Yeah, well, I, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe the therapist or the client has shut down the, that part of themselves for whatever reasons. So it's not a conscious thing inside or outside the therapy room. It's just shut down. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about, I hope, I'm talking about really people, clients or therapists that actually have, diff, have accesses to all parts of themselves. Yeah, yeah. Because in that, there's lots of reasons why I think it's really important. Because if we unconsciously or consciously shut down parts of ourselves because we think, you know, it's bad or we're ashamed of it or, or that part of ourselves or we think as therapists you sh we shouldn't be having sexual feelings or whatever unconscious or conscious choices we make, the problem is the more you compartmentalise those feelings, they then could come out uh, much with great force and you could end up actioning them and you're heading towards then much more difficult situations yeah so i see i think repression can often lead to an externalization yeah uh, a bit like um, a pressure cooker yeah. where you keep things underneath and then suddenly it comes out in a much more intensive way than it would have done yes yeah i totally agree with that yeah and um, the times that people have come to me uh, when they've talked about the expression of sexual feelings and we've worked through it or talked about it, uh, and, and I say the first step is to think about whose sexual feelings they are. And another good question to ask a therapist is, who is the client for them? In other words, to look at their developmental history. Yes, yeah. And to spend some time inquiring down that line. Now, of course, I don't want to take away the, the reason I said earlier on, which is it could be two human people who are just physically attracted to each other, or it could be two human people where one person is attracted to the other one and the other one may or may not be. I don't want to take away that sort of human encounter. But, but what I do want to say is for the therapist to inquire in supervision, about who might the client be 
uh, in the transfers process developmentally for them is a good inquiry and road to go down and a good start, I think. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and I, I can see why that is looking at it from more, uh, you know, a, a logical level as opposed to a feeling level, looking at it that way. You're kind of taking it away from the feelings and looking at it in a more logical way. Well, more more clinically, I hope. Yeah, th yeah, that's what I mean. I think the, the only thing really that I can relate it to is I've really 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 strongly felt somebody else's anxiety when I've been in the room with them so I can kind of equate that with what you're saying about who's you know eroticism who's or who does this belong to because yeah. you know and it was in group therapy while I was doing my training I was sat next to somebody and I don't class myself as an anxious person but suddenly I felt so anxious it was ridiculous so maybe and it was the person sat next to me who suddenly broke down crying having a panic attack and I kind of thought whoa it wasn't me after all <laughs> and yeah. I've never experienced anything like it before well that's called projection projective identification in the trade they're projecting feelings into you which if if the sexualization within the therapy room was anything like that I I can understand why that would be difficult it was really intense feelings that i felt of anxiety yeah yeah so if we move it over to that's the client side projecting sexual feelings into you which i think would be good to discuss in a minute because it's, you know we have bilateral transfers here if we yeah. stay with the therapist a moment that if we start off talking number one with the supervisor number one you know, it's whose feelings is it? Yeah. Right? Did inquire that. Number two, developmentally within the transference, who is the client for me, we've got a good template for starting to inquire. Yes. Now, once we've acquired that, and maybe we we find out in the transference there's a lot more to it than we thought, and it isn't actually our feelings, there's more projective identification, or maybe they remind you of X, X, and X. As we quarrel that, maybe we come to a place as two human people where one therapist is attracted to the, where the therapist is attracted to the client, which is another story, because then we need to talk about whether the therapist can talk about that clinically with this particular client. And be able to work through that in a useful way within the uh, intersubjective relationship. Or if they can't see themselves through that, or clinically it would be uh, in terms of timing or, or how we look at this and not well, good well clinically, they would need to refer on. Yeah. So these are the discussions the supervisor needs to have. It's really important though, that the therapist talks about these things because otherwise, as I said, repression or even unconscious denial will lead, I think, or could lead down a road which is more difficult. Yeah, and I, I think it's a really valuable topic to yeah. be discussing. Like you said at the beginning of this, in you know the day and age that we are around litigation and complaints and all those sort of things, within the therapy room I, I can imagine that there are therapists thinking well how would I approach this absolutely, absolutely. protecting myself you know as a, a clinician yeah how do we go about doing all of this so this is what we do this is the time the first step is we take the supervision yeah in the road I talked about we can take it to our own therapy as yeah. well too and then we can look at well you know, if it is me, that's on a human level, it's not being projected into me and it's not transferential and it's part of a human encounter that I find this person physically attractive and I'm not able to talk to the client for whatever reasons and take ownership of that and say, well, there's, you know, I'm a therapist, professional therapist, there's no ways I'm going to act out on this and we've got boundaries here and 
uh, uh, and assure the person at all different levels ethically. And if the therapist, for whatever reasons, isn't able to move through that, then they need to refer on. Um, and I think these discussions are really important because I believe that um, it, it would be very odd to, for me anyway, thinking about over many years, if I wasn't at some level sexually attracted to some of the clients, I mostly work with women or did. And, um, you know, I've got, I have got sexually attracted to women and I've taken to supervisors. I've talked about the way I'm talking about it here. And with some people, I've been, been able to move on and talk about it with the client. And then, of course, you know, it's really important that the client doesn't see it as their fault or yeah. to take care of the therapist. There's many ways where clinically it may be too difficult. So the problem of just referring on is if the client then doesn't understand it and doesn't and sees it as their fault or whatever it is. So I would really encourage the therapist to bring it out and own it and set the boundaries. Yeah. I'm not saying if both partners can't go through that, you wouldn't refer on, but <clears throat> um, I think these avenues in supervision need to be explored first. Yeah. Totally. There's something going on for me, and I don't know why it's coming over me, that if, if this did happen in the, the therapy situation and I brought it into the session and the session became about that, there's something at the back of my head that's thinking that's how would I charge the client for something where I'm talking about my feelings? Well, let's put it in another way. In the session. I, I don't know. Let's put it in another way. You're not a robot, so you're going to have lots of feelings, anger feelings, frightened, scared, and you're going to have lots of feelings. Now, in most situations, of course, and hopefully all of them, you'll stay in your adult, but, you, you know, we have feelings in our adults. So that if we're in a relational psychotherapy world, then to repress half of yourself, quarter of yourself, a third of yourself, you aren't really helping. I don't think you're helping the process altogether. So it would be very abnormal for a therapist not to have feelings in the therapeutic process. Yes. That's not, that's not the issue as far as I'm concerned. The issue is, A, whose feelings it is. Yeah. And B, um, how do you you know talk about these in a way which is which is useful to the therapeutic direction so for example if you feel i don't know angry with a client and after you've worked out well who does she remind me of or whatever it is in supervision or you know it's been projected into me i think you could say quite easily to your client you know i've been thinking about this uh, uh, during the week i felt quite frustrated or a sense of irritation with you um last session we were here and I wondered if you were about or how that might be fitting into our relationship and how does that then you know what does that say about the past and have you had, had you know to have the yeah. type of discussion which I think would be really helpful yeah and, oh I've had discussions like that about yeah so, you, so you're yeah. talking about yourself aren't you yes yeah I suppose yes yeah, so but mainly it's not, it's kind of what's happening in front of me. You know, if I feel a sudden sadness, I will say to the client, wow, yeah. that's made me feel really sad what you were saying. So I'll, yeah. I'll bring that into the therapy room. That yeah. is you talking about you just the same. Yeah. So if you have sexual feelings, they're on the same level, aren't they? They might be more intense less intense or more by me but they are still feelings yes yeah so, yeah so it's how you use those clinically and yeah. especially if they've been projected into you by the client so that on the client side for example they may have been sexualized as children the, 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 it might have been a way that the child attempts to have a bonding and dialogue with their father, and the only way they know, only way yeah. they know how to do that is through uh, seductiveness, which might be their real attempt to have close contact with their dad. Um, so there's many reasons why clients might project 
sexual feelings into the therapist. What needs to be really iterated and worked through is firstly, that it's not bad. Secondly, nothing to be ashamed of. And thirdly, is there any sense that you may do this with other people and not realize you're doing it or it doesn't help you or you end up in situations which are dangerous for you or yeah. effective for you? So you work through the transference and talk about the erotic transference in a way which is clinically positive. Yeah. And in fact, more than that, transformational. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can see from what you're saying that that would be the case. Is there, because I think intimacy in, in the therapeutic relationship is quite important. And, you know, I might be fantasizing it, but for some people, intimacy is you know sexualization and it, it's not about the connection of two human beings on a certain level without it involving sex or sexualized behavior whereas to me i can be intimate and connect with other other human being without that side of stuff hmm. so you know part i think part of a therapeutic post process often is a educative therapy where yeah. you may teach them the difference between intimacy and sex or or they might have clients uh, which have, uh, you know, confusion about sex and love. Yes, uh, yeah. And all these things we're talking about. So not only can do educative therapy, but also you can take, you can look back. Uh, this is in TA would be deconfusion or decontamination we're gonna talk about, where, you know, there could have been sexual abuse, there could have been yeah. sexual inappropriateness, where the person, is it going to be logically confused? Mm. Well, could a lot have been a hurt, a lot of hurt, a lot of healing needed, and uh, and that's why I said transformational, really. Yeah. And again, you know, I'm thinking about certain, you know, personality disorders, sexualized behaviour, and risk taking, and things like that is part of the diagnosis that I'm presuming would come up in the therapy room as well. Well, people who have been sexually abused, sexually traumatized, sexually used inappropriately. Uh, of course, let's not forget the trauma of that. Mm. And the trauma of that leads often to confusion and disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's from that early abuse and trauma that we need to move towards healing. Yeah. Rather than see this as a pathological disturbance necessarily. So what you're alluding to, of course, is that with, say, multiple personality disorder, which is now dissociative identity disorder, one of those would be that uh, there's been a lot of the trauma, a lot of promiscuousness, a lot of sexualizations. Uh, and in, in the latest DSM-5 or diagnostic manual, they often talk about that in a quite a pathological way. Well, I, I see from ex extreme trauma like that leads often to confusion, fragmentation and disorder. Mm -hmm. So by looking back at our, or using what might be presented in the therapy room to go backwards often leads to healing and transformation. Yeah. But none of this will happen unless there's a discussion. No, no, unless there's a conversation. I agree, yeah, yeah. Now it's very, very hard, I think, for lots of clients to say and talk about feeling with, hear romantic feelings with the therapist. You know, I think it's hard enough for therapists who often, I said, shut themselves down, I think, disown parts of themselves and then don't take it to supervision and it never gets discussed and they intellectualize things instead. It's often doubly hard for the client because they often feel more vulnerable and more hurt and there's a lot of healing to be gone. They think it's their fault and all those sorts of things. So I think the therapist is the person often needs to initiate conversations if they feel it clinically appropriate. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you know, think, many clients. Go on. No, I was just going to say, I think that's more likely to happen in the therapy room rather than the client actually saying something to the therapist. I would imagine there's a lot of fear and shame that you, you'll stop the sessions, that you will end the therapy if they say. Yeah. Anything I, about I, it. They'd be yeah. abandoned. <laughs> yeah. I see most of the what people might call stuckness or 
uh, sexualized behavior is often a, a you know a real desire to be able to talk to their therapist but they just actually don't know how to do it mm. rather than speaking in a sexualized way because that's the way they were programmed to yes yeah yeah and wouldn't the world be a better place if we just found it easy to talk about every subject <laughs> than have taboos and limits and on what we can and can't say? Yeah, and I, but I, and I think, you know, it's interesting. There aren't many videos, seminars, discussions about this subject we're talking about here. And I think because, as I said before, I think for the therapist particularly, they they cut down part of themselves. They're often afraid of any sexual expression they that comes up, which leads then to what I call defensive psychotherapy, where they shut down and pass themselves and don't even mention the supervisor because they're afraid of ethics and litigation. Yeah. We yeah. end we end up in a defensive psychotherapy situation. Yeah. So my biggest plea for people listening to this podcast would be therapists particularly to take all these issues to their supervisor or therapist supervisor, I think is the first step. Um, and I think to, to be very mindful about, you know, how a client is dialoguing and talking to them, to the therapist, because I do really believe that uh, a lot of the traumas that happen mean that clients may talk in, or want an attempt, attempt to get a relationship with their client, but they don't know how to do it. So they often unconsciously fall into the process we're talking about here and especially people who've been sexually abused yeah so supervision is the way to go with it yeah and just to pick up on something you said which i just want to say and i hear you've, <laughs> you, you, you you sort of perhaps um you know it's not in your field of vision but of course you know a lot of female therapists get attracted to their female clients. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. have to be because, you know, in this, you know, uh, in, 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 you know, so that's that's what I wanted to say there. Many, many clients, you know, same sex, are attracted to the same sex in our profession. So you can have, you know, I worked with 90% women, but doesn't mean I am not couldn't be attracted to a man and vice versa. So there's, this is cross gender it isn't simply you know stereotypically gender orientate orientation here yeah 100 percent. i can uh, only talk from my own experience and yeah, well, it's maybe quite clear at the beginning but yeah i think i think that it's an area which i would encourage therapists to talk about more and perhaps even think about more and, and see it as not something bad or sh to be ashamed about but actually to learn from and actually may if they could bring it up be transformational for the client in front of them yeah especially if they think about it transformationally and developmentally and clinically yeah yeah i agree with what you're saying but, but because it's never actually presented itself in the therapy room for me would you recommend bringing it up as a topic well, you as, as the just the general course of therapy that it could be a possibility at some point in the line. This happens before it actually happens. Yes, especially. Well, we're in a podcast. I'll probably talk to you off air about um, your first sentence and sentence about it. But uh, if, if you if if a person if a therapist chooses to cut down part of themselves consciously or unconsciously, then that's their choice. But I would find it very odd for a therapist not have, or a human, one human being not to have, uh, or at least the expression of sexual feelings if they're working intimately and closely with uh, other people over many years. I am very odd, Bob. <laughs> but I didn't want to make it personal to you because I'm, I'm sure many therapists do cut off part of themselves consciously or unconsciously because they feel it's bad or they feel that somehow there'll be some catastrophic consequences to having feelings for clients or somehow they feel ashamed of that or they feel of litigation and ethicality. And that is a great shame, I think, because 
you're only bringing, or the person might only bring three quarters of themselves to the therapeutic dialogue. Yeah. I'm, I'm in a total agreement with you, Bob. Yeah. You know, so it's an important subject. And I, I'll answer yes, I do think it's important for therapists to take it to their supervisors before, uh, as a general topic of discussion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that the, the topic is discussed enough, 100 percent. Yeah. Mm. But again, we've all got our own baggage. Do you know, <laughs> it's it's one of those things, If you know, our own life script. It comes with us in the therapy room. You know, my family is, is very closed about affection in any form whatsoever, oh, whether yeah. that's. Yeah, well, perhaps this is another podcast, you see, I which is should be titled some something like are our, our therapists scripted and programmed to uh we, we could talk on, on about of yeah. course all therapists have their own scripts and yes yeah have their own scripts and that's why that's why of course therapists have their own therapy and that's why therapists especially in i think um competent psychotherapy training programs especially the uk cp ones demand therapists to have their own therapy and at least I think it's 160 hours in a four-year program. So I'm very much a believer in people uh, reflecting on a, how their own script can actually hinder the therapeutic process yeah. or not. Yes, yeah, totally. So we're on the same ballpark there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And maybe there's work to be done for me. <laughs> um, for most therapists, I don't think it's... I just think this particular area is not reflected and talked about enough. No, no, it's not. And I think you you have touched on it about litigation and fear of, you know, repercussions of the conversation and things. And I think that's a really valid thing in this day and age, you know, because so many therapists are scrutinised. Yeah, there's a good book by David Mann that came out about 2011. And I think the title is Erotic Transference. It might be a longer title than that but if you put David Mann into the for the therapist list, listing I'm talking about here yeah. um, you would come up with that I think it's really important and I think to bear in mind it's also very difficult for clients and also um, I said this three times I'm aware but I think I'm very passionate about it is for many therapists to, uh, sorry many clients to be traumatized especially at a sexual level um you know, but it's often that they are confused about love and sex, and it's often a language they the only language they know, and it's a way to get talk to the therapist and to have some connection. Yes, yeah, yeah, and I think we need to be mindful of that in the therapy room that you know the the connection can be sought through lots of different means. Mm. Yeah, fact, it's, it's another level of relational need. Yeah, we need yeah. to look at. And intimacy is one of the needs, however we... Yeah, sexual expression is yeah, That's it, yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's a big subject, uh, but I, I'm glad we're doing a, we've done a podcast on it or doing a podcast on it because it, it, it's a subject area which I think therapists, and I don't put any send disservice to people listening, uh, perhaps don't reflect on it enough, and the clinical implications and the, the, path, the pathways to clinical transformation for the client yeah. through these these types of uh, and maybe it is one of those situations as well where until it happens in the therapy room or until we're kind of made aware of it we wouldn't do anything with it whereas if people are listening to this podcast then maybe it will open up areas for discussion for them whether that's in supervision or in the therapy room yeah and these are the things that happen behind closed doors and yeah unless it's actually tackled, can lead, unfortunately, to um, things being acted out, which are harmful for the client uh, and need never have gone down that direction. Uh, could have been talked about and dealt with in different ways before um, a harmful one. Yes, and, and 100%, like you said, is, you know, it's a human feeling we are all human whether we're therapists clients supervisors or whatever 
Yeah, I think that's the bit really. We're all humans, clients and therapists, and therapists were usually always clients as well. So in in the world of humanity, it's an important area to talk about and not to feel bad about. Yeah. Yeah. And and you've kind of given permission for that to be discussed, which I think is brilliant on a taboo subject or possibly seen as a taboo subject. Yeah, I just not talk to them enough about yeah. it, I think. Yeah. So what we're going to be discussing in the next one, Bob, is different approaches to therapy and how that guides our work. Well, that will be really interesting because um, clients, who, of course, who come for assessments and then go into work, often don't even know about different approaches. Yes, there's so many that I don't even know about. So we're discussing that one in the next podcast, Bob, so yeah, I shall see you that. soon. Yeah, see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.